Hi, I'm Dan Barker, and welcome to this week's FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, and uh, this is our anniversary week at the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Actually, the 40th anniversary week, 40th anniversary month, 40th anniversary year of the creation of FFRF as a national group. So today we're going to talk about the history of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, how it started and how we grew and some of the many wins and a few losses over the years. And after we're done, uh, you can ask questions. Uh, if you're looking on Facebook Live, you can just type a question into the Facebook Live deal and we'll, it'll get to us and we can respond to your question. Or if you want, you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org and we'll do our best to get through that. But 40 years is quite an accomplishment and uh, we're also going to show uh, some pictures. I don't know which pictures. We, we got a whole bunch. A lot of, just throwing in a whole lot of photos showing 40 years of activism, kind of random. but. Um, so you might see pictures that we don't explain, but at least it shows some of the history over the many decades and maybe we'll comment on some of those, some of those pictures as we go. So how do we start? Do you, do you, should I, you, you were one of the co-founders, right? Yes, I, I was. I was a college student back in 1976. We started as a regional group, and then in 1978, um, my mother and I um, had founded the regional group, and she was asked to go national with it in 1978. And on April 5th, 1978, the incorporation papers were filed, and the formal founding meeting happened on April uh, 8th. So this is the anniversary, 40th anniversary week. Wow. And um, I was a college student, so this whole thing is dating me a lot. We're showing a timeline. That little picture of me in a hat um, uh, was when I was able to stop prayer um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It was one of my early accomplishments, and it gave us a false sense of how easy it would be to end violations. I was able to stop a 122-year tradition of prayer by the University of Wisconsin in, at Madison. So was that your, like and your journalistic hat that you're wearing? There, I guess so, and my mother w took her first lawsuit in those very early years before the formal founding. And on the timeline, you'll see 1978, the red letter year when we went national. And we started with three of us, my uh, mother, myself, and the gentleman there who's smoking, John Sontark, was kind enough to lend his name so we wouldn't be a mother-daughter team only. Uh, we founded FFRF expressly to complain about prayer at the City Council and Dane County Board meetings here in Madison. And uh, a newspaper reporter covered it. It was big news. He said we had a snowball's chance in hell of stopping the prayer, but within a year we had. And uh, so we went from the original three of us to gradually um, uh, founding in 1978. I think we had about 500 or 100 thousand people then. So a snowball does have a chance in hell if there is no hell, right? So it actually worked. Right. And before we show some of those other pictures, I just wanted to explain that besides founding FFRF for the practical purpose uh, back in those days of complaining about prayer by the government, there was, uh, of course, a, b a deeper purpose there. Um, my mother was an early abortion rights activist. Um, and was a national abortion rights activist when abortion was illegal. And she and I, uh, following her around as a junior high school kid, uh, saw that the organized enemy of women's rights, the opposition to women's rights and reproductive rights, was clearly religion. Uh, and that we must um, make sure that it was never used in our laws about women, that it could not hold sway over our civil um, laws and civil rights. And I came from um, three generations of free thinkers mm -hmm. and um, uh, a family of nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And so we, uh, that was our awakening. It could have been something else. It could have been gay rights or creationism, but in our case, it was the harm of religion to women. It still is. And it's still, <laughs> here the, it the is, 42 years rights. later, and we're fighting the same battles. And, and my mother felt very strongly that we would never get to the root of the problem with women's rights unless we were to get religion out of government and expose the harm of religion. So when you started the group with your mom in 76, 78, were you imagining a future like this where we would have 33,000 members today 
and 25 staff and nine full-time attorneys. Were you picturing that or were you just fighting each battle as they came? Well, what do you think? <laughs> well, we actually wanted, we never wanted to have a job like this. We were all volunteer originally and we um, wanted to do ourselves out of having an organization. We don't think there should be a need for an organization to work for separation of church and state in a country that was founded on a godless and entirely secular constitution. And we naively thought it would take just a few years to remind the country of our secular roots in order to prevail. And Jerry Falwell was, was in ascendancy, and he was a media darling, and we thought we, we've got to be there reminding the country um, that we are predicated on, on secularism and how it has protected us. So, but obviously that was naive, hmm. and I think that in order to be a, a founder of a controversial group, you really need to be an optimist. So we were very optimistic, and so no, we didn't think we'd be here 40 years later, but I'm delighted to be here 40 years later with 32,000 members. We started with three, um, with a growing staff of 25, including nine constitutional attorneys. Um, a very dedicated uh, other staff in all regards, and uh, and so many dedicated members, and we're moving forward. So now let's look at some of the other uh, timeline that we have. We can comment on. We have our videographer Bruce. That was the first timeline. We're going to look at some more. Um, we have uh, from 1980s. Okay. 1980s. We got a lot of media attention when my mother sued Ronald Reagan for signing a law, a resolution making 1983 the year of the Bible. We did a lot of education about that. Um, we had some of our first conventions. There's Isaac Asimov. Um, the timeline continues. Um, Dan, maybe you want to talk about Butterfly McQueen? Well, Butterfly McQueen was a life member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. She was the actress. She played in a lot of movies, but best known for the movie Gone with the Wind, which was 1939. She played the little maid, the little slave maid uh, in Gone with the yeah, Wind. Yeah, it was a very, um, not a nice part, but she did a very good job, a good job with it. Her, but that her, was all that she was they prissy. were offering African-American actresses in the 1930s. And she was a lifelong atheist, and she, uh, she really cared. She used to talk about, um, they talk about the streets of gold in heaven, but the streets on earth are dirty. Let's clean up this life first. So she really cared. Uh, and she spoke at one of our conventions, and I got to accompany her on the piano. And she said, as my ancestors are free from slavery, I am free from the slavery of religion. Yeah. So we have some more timeline there. Um, now we're going into the 1990s, um, and that's showing Prissy, uh, that's showing Butterfly McQueen when she died in 1995 in a fire. And um, FFRF got a lot of attention out of that because she had left in her will um, her checking account to FFRF. It hmm. was so kind. There was nothing left in the end, but we got so much publicity and people were so amazed that Butterfly McQueen was a dedicated atheist who cared about separation of church and state. There's pictures of other activists, um, the Clevelands books. from Alabama, Catherine Farringer, yeah. books that we published, your book, Dan. Catherine Farringer there on the bottom left is pictured with you and your mom. She was a Texas, act, the Lone Star activist for free thought for many, many years. Catherine was just a stalwart member of FFRF and, and did a lot for state church separation. And I think we're moving into the 1990s, and uh, we did a lot of uh, work in Alabama with Lake Hypatia. You can see that big star there, and the first Atheist and Foxhole Monument was erected. The first Emperor Has No Clothes Award was given in 2000 to um, Steven Weinberg, Steven Weinberg the, the Nobel laureate physicist, who said, um, good people will do good things and bad people will do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. religion. Yeah, that was a very controversial... Uh, Dan, your first album, a double album, Friendly Neighborhood Atheist, musical CD. And then that picture on the right is a picture... You, it, you, you drove to Milwaukee to document the removal of the very first Eagles Ten Commandments monument ever placed on public property, and FFRF got it taken down. It was the first one put up and it was the first one we got taken down. So. And who was at that dedication? Well, originally? you know, the movie Ten Commandments had Yul Brynner who played Pharaoh and Charlton Heston who played Moses, but uh, Yul Brynner showed up in Milwaukee in the 1950s to dedicate that monument. And so now I got to drive over and take a picture of them picking it up and taking it off public property, and they took it, what did they take it to, like a private church or something? Well, we don't care, just yeah. so it's not on public property. And then we're looking into the 2000s. 
Um, lots of faith-based initiative wins for us. Um, one of our attorneys there outside counsel, um, Rich Bolton, um, in a different case, um, we got Ten Commandments fenced in. There's a picture there from La Crosse. Our first billboards were put up in 2007 after three decades of censorship. And we had the very first roadside full-size billboard. I was that, that's a 48-footer there, that, that picture on the left there in Madison, Wisconsin. The first actual billboard for atheism and free thought in, in the country. And since then, there have been what? How many more have we? Oh, thousands, thousands of billboards. More. And we're putting some up in Georgia right now. Yeah. Maybe you want to talk about Oliver Sacks there? Oliver Sacks, uh, the famous author and neurologist um, who wrote the book Awakenings and the man who mistook his wife for a hat. He came and spoke at one of our conferences and became a good friend of ours over the uh, years. He, was, he got an Emperor Has No Clothes Award for yeah. making known his descent from religion. And maybe a little bit about Yaparburg there. We published Rhymes for the Irreverent. That, so that in, uh, book there, yeah, that book there at the middle there, Rhymes for the Irreverent. Yip Harburg, the famous songwriter who wrote uh, Over the Rainbow, It's Only a Paper Moon, April in Paris, Finian's Rainbow. Uh, he died in the 80s, but his son, Ernie Harburg, and the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we cooperated in collecting some of Yip Harburg's, not his lyrics, but he wrote some light verse, some poetry. So, and we found some previously unpublished poems that we got to put together into this book called Rhymes for the Irreverent. It's, it's really funny and it's very powerful and some of the poems are quite moving. And you see Julia Sweeney there, her first um, speech before an FFRF conference, and we've enjoyed so much working with her. The comedian. We also started our first radio show in 2006, and now we're almost done here, another timeline. Um, ads by, on radio by Janine Garofalo, um, by Ron Reagan for the first time. Um, our, we, we had put up bus signs in the 70s, and we got, um, after 20 years, we put up uh, sleeping on Sundays and other bus signs. Huh. You can see Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, yeah. getting an Emperor Award, um, all kinds of billboards and activism. And I see Richard Dawkins over there getting an award. Um, and let's finish up with that timeline. Uh, our first honorary president, Steven Pinker. Um, in 2014, Ron Reagan was so kind to film um, a TV commercial for us. A 30-second ad. That's yeah. been censored but run on CNN and um, MSNBC. Um, and there's uh, um, the big um, expansion of FFRF. We can see some of the donors there, Stephen and Diane Yule. Our first foray into refurbishing and creating public statuary of freethinkers, refurbishing Robert Ingersoll in Peoria, um, Clarence Darrow there in Dayton, Tennessee, home mm -hmm. of the Scopes trial, and, uh, and just moving forward from that point. But now we have some other um, photos from from the 80s and And by the way, times. that timeline that we just saw is in a supplement insert in the April Free Thought Today. It's an eight-page insert, which has a much broader, more detailed um, timeline of the history of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. It's got articles by me, by you, and the whole timeline of all of our legal work. Um, and, legal victories. And yeah. it's got um, kind of endorsements for, from our honorary officers that we're very proud of. So if you're a member, you'll be getting that probably this week. You'll be getting it pretty soon. We just mailed that out. If you're not a member, you can join and, and get Free Thought today. Or you can get a sample copy. All you have to do is go to our website at ffref.org and say, um, send me some info and we'll be sending you the complimentary issue Free Thought today. It's also mobile friendly now if you don't like paper. But we do have more photographs that we can show you as we talk about FFRF's 40 years of activism. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the very early photos of the first, one of the first lawsuits. That's my mother on the right and Nicole Gaylord. We were a dining room table operation. There's your mom back there on the dining room table. as we were collating our first newsletter before we had a newspaper. We moved into offices in the early 80s, tiny offices, and uh, we're going to show the progression there in a minute. There, there's where we're crowded. I was just renting offices. I wasn't a staff member then. Um, but I was volunteer, and uh, we were uh, growing fast. Our first TV show was on cable in Madison. That was our What's Wrong with the Ten Commandments TV show um, with Sheila uh, Jensen. There I am, a student, free thought, feminist activist. And with your journalist hat. And uh, 
Um, that was my mother's appearance on Donahue in 78, I think, yeah. which was a phenomenal boost. He was a big uh, talk, um, show, talk show host. host. That was the Gaylor versus Reagan lawsuit that got an immense amount of national publicity. Educating about the harm of the Bible in our law. That was a lawsuit that we won in Madison where the university was given away student names to churches to proselytize us and I was disgusted. I'm, I'm there, my mother and John, uh, one of our plaintiffs. There is Anne in front of the Capitol when we were suing over a legislative prayer. Um, we have taken over 70 lawsuits. That was a volunteer carol for our TV show, uh, cable TV show that just tried to get a bunch of old photos together to kind of show some of our first student winners. When we first started our essay competition in the 70s, we now have four, giving over $40,000 a year in scholarship prizes. I knew some of those kids. I wonder what they look like today. Well, that was 30 some years ago. And I think we have more photos oh. coming up in a minute as soon as our video, video From producer. From the 1980s maybe? Uh, our beleaguered producer can get to them here. There's Crossfire um, with Anna, uh, with Pat Buchanan. Yeah. Um, who was personally very nice, she said, but, you know, what is views? Now, Dan, you should talk about how we found you. So, um, I just came out of the ministry in 1984, and uh, I got a call from uh, the producers of the show hosted by Oprah Winfrey, and that's the show that you and I met each other on. And then I joined the foundation that year. And uh, at the time, the foundation had about um, maybe a thousand members, which we thought was pretty big and we kept going from there. And um, there's Ishmael Jaffrey. Our first free thinker of the year, he won a Supreme Court decision against prayer masquerading as meditation in the schools. We've had him recently on Free Thought Radio. He is He's live, still alive. retired, wonderful guy, um, a true champion of the First Amendment and mm. kick, a wonderful way to kick off that award, which we give every year to successful litigants on separation of church and yeah. state. And uh, I think we have more pictures coming. But Dan, tell us a little bit more about your story. But, I mean, you wrote me a letter. Well, yeah, I was, you know, I was a preacher for 19 years. And when I came out, I was reading everything I could find. And I found your book, um, Woe to the Women, the Bible Tells Me So. Um, I feel funny telling you this because you already, <laughs> we already know this. But anyway, the audience doesn't know this. Uh, and then so I wrote you a letter saying, really good book. I'm glad to see how the Bible's... Uh, affects modern law, the treatment of women. And then and I never you, wrote you back. You didn't write back, <laughs> but your mother wrote back, and so that's how that Oprah show came about. I was very about. impressed, but I was working two jobs, and you asked, it wasn't really a fan letter, you wanted information on yeah. the Freedom From Religion Foundation, I just had to get my act together and get some envelopes, I didn't have them. Well, next time and somebody <laughs> thanks you for writing a book, put a little note, <laughs> and, you know, respond and say, but who so knows she, what the future could hold? She asked <laughs> <laughs> Um, she asked you to write up your story, and then you were going to be speaking that year at the convention. But when yeah. we were on Oprah Winfrey, um, it was a, a Christians Anonymous where people were supposed to call in a toll-free number when they were trying to get away from the addiction of religion. And uh, she did a whole show about it, but she knew that my mother and I, we'd been on her show before in Baltimore, were not religious. And so she wanted to have people who had been very religious who had left religion. And one of the other persons was Rita Bell, a ca yeah. an ex-Catholic there in Chicago. And then there was you, and we were surprised. They would fly you all the way from California to Chicago and because um, you had such a dramatic story. And that was the very first time I had ever publicly spoken about atheism in my life. And not only that, the very first time I had ever spoken before a hostile audience. And, and you that audience was, yes. was pretty amazing. Because you were only getting affirmation when you were preaching. Yeah, correct? when you're a preacher, everybody's out there, praise God, amen, and you just, it's all, you know. But here, Oprah's producers had packed that audience with a bunch of Bible thumpers, and one woman called you a witch or something. Oh, they were really hostile during the commercials. Uh, but, it was like they were going to tar and feather us. But anyway, it, it made for great TV, actually. It was really a fascinating experience. But Dan, um, we met for the first time at breakfast. Um, yeah. My mother and I met you, and you told us later, you had never actually met, I think with one exception, knowingly met another atheist. Yeah, I right. never actually knowingly talked with one. I met a guy who was, but we didn't talk. But that was the first time that I had knowingly said, oh, these are atheists and they're proud about it. And I, we could just talk to another atheist openly. So that was, I could call that a de-baptism by fire. <laughs> And of course, you can see that show. It's not a very good version of it, but you can. We put that up on YouTube. 
Yeah, look look for uh, Barker, right Gaylor, Oprah, 1984. You can look for that online. And then since that, you, you joined the staff in 87, I joined in 85, and, um, and then you became our public relations director. Yeah. And I've written so many books for us and for other groups and then other publishers. But now we have more photographs, and these are going to be kind of random. So I think we'll just keep talking about FFRF in general while these um, photographs of our history play. Um, I wanted to talk about the litigation. Um, we have over taken over, I think, 80 lawsuits. We have won two-thirds of them huh. and ha are winning uh, far more than that in our current lawsuits that are not settled yet. Eight out of 13, we have won one round. Um, and many of these lawsuits were um, a very important lawsuits, you know, removing Ten Commandments from public parks. Yeah. Um, in the Jesus statue uh, in a public park. At least it got taken off the public park and yeah. fenced. And the Good Friday was an official state holiday in Wisconsin. That's one of our favorite mottos, beware pious politicians, that's Ann Gaylor. That's your mother? We were yeah. picketing the chaplain, the U.S. Huh. chaplain. Oh, there's, and there's our, John Sontag. The founding member who lived for just a year after we started. If FFR. he hadn't smoked, he might have lived longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's Vashi McCollum and Roy Torcaso, both champions of the First Amendment who've won Supreme Court cases. Vashti's case, the precedent that all other cases are based on in schools. Pat and Roger Cleveland, activists in Alabama who ran our, our Lake Hypatia Free Thought yeah, Advance there for 20 years. years. That's um, that's the entrance to the Lake Hypatia Free Thought Hall in Alabama. Put up by a veteran, Bill Teague, and he also did our um, our atheist and foxes. That's my father, Paul Gaylor, who is behind the scenes, but our hardest working volunteer, and he took many of the photographs that we're seeing. That's uh, Isaac Asimov speaking at our New Jersey chapter meeting, um, really only a few years before he died. And you met him there, and, and there's a, a FFRS march. contingent at the abortion rally in D.C. Um, we've been, had, had contingents at several of the national rallies. Um, and there's your your book, Betrayal of Trust, about the clergy who abuse children. The first nonfiction book about that topic that was ever published in 88. the late 80s. And oh, what wow. is that? Oh, there's oh. a Free Thought Today, uh, 1983. And um, and that was we constantly tussled with the University of Wisconsin Madison over Bucky praying. Hmm. Um, we got the Attorney General to help us with that one in the old days. There's Denver, Colorado. We sued over the Ten Commandments Monument. And we actually won an, in the appeals decision, but then it was overturned. A typical picture of the media uh, hovered around and Gaylor. That was the first atheist winter solstice sign put up in a Capitol. Just a picture from one of our conventions that I thought was awfully cute. Yeah. Little, little girls, fast friends. Um, many of these photographs we're seeing now were taken by Brent Castro. And there's the, the marriage savers lawsuit that we took in with Wisconsin. With our first case taken with a clergyman yeah. from the UCC. And there's the Ten Commandments being removed from the Milwaukee, is it the courthouse? Was that where it was? Yeah. yeah. Some of these are repeated, but you're getting to see them close up. And um, Pete Singer. Yeah. Getting an Emperor Has No Clothes Award. Yeah. We've had many distinguished honorees. This is one of my favorite photos. We picketed the installation of a bishop by the Catholic <laughs> Church. Where are the women bishops? And look at those bishops. Boy, were they Up ever the mean. Top, yeah. Blanche Fern, who was such an important benefactor toward the purchase of our building, Feet That Hall, and a volunteer in so many other ways. From Florida. Who died many years ago. Clarence Rinder, who was our all-important plaintiff in suing over the Marshfield Jesus statue, a case that we essentially won. Um, and he, he's now dead. Another picture of Steven Weinberg. Steven Weinberg, the Nobel laureate with my mother. Yeah. Um, I thought that was 1999. We, uh, this is one of our plaintiffs. Phyllis Grams. Who got death threats and she would get the, uh, answer the phone and there'd be these awful threats and she'd say, tell me more. She was fearless. And there's Pat and Roger again. Southern activists. Um, getting uh, honored for Probably their Probably around 1999. There's that picture again of the, the dining room table where it all started. And we went from a newsletter to a newspaper. Um, that was our first TV commercial, uh, which was Sheila Thompson. She later changed her name to Sheila Jensen. 
And Dan, you also did commercial for us. I don't know if oh, that's the Oh, at the piano, that's show. right. I did that. Um, FFRF published the first anthology of women free thinkers, and I'm the editor of that book, and there I am with some of these wonderful heroines from history. was it? One of the outside attorneys we've worked with. Bob, Bob Tiernan. Bob Tiernan, great guy. One in Colorado. very interesting cases for us. And, and more, more freedom from religion on, on the march. Your, your mother's on the left there. So stand. many rallies over the years. Hmm. Um, that was the first um, signs uh, in San Antonio, street signs with our name on it, when we had a convention. That's your, your mother, you, and Catherine. Of course, balancing religious signs. And, Bill, and here's building Free Thought Hall in Alabama, the, the second ground. phase. Groundbreaking. And uh, Dan, we published your book, Losing Faith and Faith. 1992. And I used many, to have hair. How many debates have you been have you done for FFRF? This week I am doing debate number 130, public formal moderated debates, and I'm going to Pennsylvania tonight actually to do another debate. And I think aren't you doing the second one tomorrow? Corliss Lamont, Butterfly McQueen, and Dan there at there a convention. Corliss Lamont, famous humanist, and um, there's some of our free thinking members. That was and St. Louis, I think. We we owe all of everything we have accomplished to our membership. We do everything in, in their name, in your name. A children's book. We published a children's book called Just Pretend. Yeah, you never saw Happy Atheist Kids before. <laughs> Vashti McCollum, who was one of our honorary um, members who won that Supreme Court decision. So important in 1948. And there's Phyllis Grahams again. We, yeah, we have some random pictures showing. Um, and then I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the other activism. Gloria Hershiser sued Roy Moore with Al Falconberry on behalf of our chapter. That was the it, first lawsuit the Alabama against judge. the praying judge Roy Moore. That was my first speech. That was 1984, September was it, in Milwaukee. That my very first talk uh, to the convention, standing on the premises. You were a baby atheist. Now we don't know where that, that's... Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I don't know where that picture came from. Well, that's it. She, she, <laughs> um, she was not one of the founders. That was the film that we did, Champions, our second film, Champions of the First Amendment, and we, which we interviewed Vashti McCollum, Roy Tarcaso, and um, uh, uh, Mr. Shemp, who all won cases. And here was a victory, with the plaintiffs in a victory. Uh, in front of Bronson LaFollette, who was a free thinker. Jack Kevorkian spoke to our conference. We were the first national group to get him to speak. He was an agnostic, In the very, 1990s, important, yeah. pr um, very important, very uh, important progressive. Yeah. So um, there's an awful lot of history. Some of this uh, not pictured um, billboards, especially and bus signs and advertisements. We've tried to do a lot of out of the closet work, um, taking a cue from the gay movement about the necessity of speaking out if it's safe for you to identify as a non-believer, because that's why there's so many bad myths about atheists and agnostics. Mm. Many people have knowingly never met one. Just like you when you, yeah, when I we know. First met you in I thought I was the only one. And in, in I remember when I started working here at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we would get letters from people saying, Help, I'm the only atheist in Nebraska because they would think that because they didn't know anybody else. And, you know, we probably have all met a lot of atheists and agnostics, but you just don't know it because we don't have horns, how do you tell them apart? And I think a lot of people um, properly give FFF a great deal of credit for our work for separation of church and state, but we also have two purposes. One is to keep religion out of government, and the other is to educate the public about non-theism. And this is equally important. It's in our bylaws, it's in our corporation papers. So we um, do a lot of public relations and myth debunking, all, not just on on the idea that we're a Christian nation, a total myth, but in the myths against uh, non-believers, that we can't be good without God and so on. Yeah. So um, we have many new plans afoot. So we are glad to look at our past and celebrate what we've accomplished and thank our members for helping us accomplish it. But we also are looking forward. And we have a great many challenges. And we provide a service for people who have to keep their heads down if you see a violation in your town, but you don't want to be identified, you don't want people knowing, oh, that's the parent who's the atheist kid, we can go to bat for you. Our attorneys can send letters out, we can remind the school about the law, and we can often correct an abuse without going to court, which I think is one of the powers of our legal staff. 
hundreds and hundreds of legal victories that never even had to go to court, just from a letter. So. And I think at some point, um, Bruce, our videographer, has a picture of the current building, the expanded building with our staff. Yeah, there we. So we trotted out our 25 staff members and some other um, volunteers uh, one cold day in February to take a picture of, of our expanded building. Um, you know, it's trying to put free thought uh, on the map. Yeah. And we all need a place to work. There are many challenges and many violations of separation of church so and that, state. So that little remedy. front part there that we're standing in front of was the original building. And then behind it and above it, we quadrupled our space by expanding back and up. So Thanks now to many, many kind donors. Many donors. And if you come into the building, you'll see the names of people who gave specially. And you can see that. the patio. There's a fence. We also have our, our own granite monument to atheists and foxholes there. In, in the Rose Zerwick Memorial Garden. And we also have the first ever atheist marquee. And mm -hmm. that uh, messages can change every five minutes. Sometimes we leave the same message up, but it, they change every day. And we like to uh, celebrate famous free thinkers, but we also put up free thought slogans. Geez, there are religious marquees with dumb sayings all over the country. So we're glad to have something to begin yeah. to at least try to balance that. And um, so I think that um, we want to see if there are any questions. Well, there are questions. If you have a question, type it into Facebook. It'll get to here. It'll get to this little machine here somehow. By, by some spiritual magic, it gets here. And, uh, or else you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. So we do have a question. Here's a question from Phil Monroe, a oh, long-time hey, long mm -hmm. member. Uh, Phil asks... What has been your most important win and disappointing loss? What do you think was our, our best win? Oh, you know, it's always the, it's kind of, it's always the last loss. The most recent one? What do you think was the most important win? I can tell you about the losses. Um, well, right now, the, I think the housing allowance is a, a big important win. But it's not settled. It's not settled yet, but it's a strong if, victory. If we can win that. At, at the appeals level or the Supreme Court level, we will have accomplished a huge re yeah. reform of the IRS. You know, explain it briefly. Yeah, because clergy get to exclude their housing from income, which gives ministers and priests and rabbis a huge tax benefit the rest of us don't get. So the court has told it. We went to court three times, and and and. We lost on standing on the second We've won. Time. We've won. Yeah, we won the case and lost on standing. So we're back in, in court correcting that. So I think that's a strong one. Uh, declaring, uh, getting rid of the Good Friday holiday in well, Wisconsin. Well, I was going to say, Phil, um, if you don't mind my talking about my favorite win rather than, my most one of, than our most important win, for me, um, emotionally and practically, it was overturning Good Friday as a state holiday. And we were among the plaintiffs. In those days, it was easy to be a plaintiff. We had state workers, university workers, and then we just, you and I, my mother, were able to be plaintiffs as Wisconsin citizens. And there was a state law in Wisconsin passed in the 40s, amended in the 50s, mandating you shall worship between the hours of 11 and 3. And then it was amended in the 50s that all governmental offices had to close at noon. And Dan, you and I once took a camera all around town and took pictures of the mad people, you know, going to the library, going like this to the doors. They yeah, student, not, students with, <laughs> with, the, the with their notes, they're grabbing the library university door and, and it's locked at 12 noon uh, on Good Friday. Or the uh, Madison Public Library down the block from us. We went over to the city county building. It was ridiculous. And we hmm. were able to um, uh, stop that. And, and then after we won the lawsuit, that next Good Friday, the libraries were packed. And I took my young daughter there. <laughs> and it was like a big celebration. Yeah, so, so that, that was my favorite victory. But in terms of the greatest loss, the obvious answer is the Hine decision that we lost at the Supreme Court on standing. The question was, did anyone have the right to sue Bush over his creation of the White House and cabinet level faith-based offices? And the answer of the Supreme Court in a plurality decision was no. Um, it was a, a, a great setback, but we would have won if O'Connor had stayed on the court. She was on the court when we started that lawsuit. And we actually won the plurality. Four of them were with us. 
more were with us than were agreeing with each other on the opposition. But the reason that was disappointing was that we had a win in the lower court. We had a win at the appeals court saying that we were right. And the Supreme Court did not overturn the win. The Supreme Court did not say we were wrong. Or that it was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court basically said, you don't have the right to sue. So they ducked the issue and we lost it only on standing, not on the merits. In fact, one of the justices during oral arguments said that what George Bush was doing was, might very well be unconstitutional, but that we were just kicked out of court because we did, there was no, they called it, there was no nexus between the taxpayer and the executive decision. Even so. though that was untrue because we showed that it was all budgeted. It, and basically the meaning of that law is that if an executive branch uses discretionary funding to violate the Constitution, taxpayers do not have the right to sue. In fact, nobody has the right to sue. This is a very bad situation. But, And then the other case that got away that I feel the strongest about is, and we had such a good case, was the National Day of Prayer. And we won that in 2010 with a resounding decision by Judge Barbara Crabb. Go ahead and Google it. It's eloquent. In which she said um, the government no more had the right to declare a national day of prayer than to declare, declare a national day of blasphemy or to tell people that they had to conduct rune magic or go into a... Rune, a, are you any? Rune yeah, magic. Or go into an Indian sweat lodge. Um, and uh, this is when Congress, at the behest of Billy Graham, um, passed a law saying that the um, president has to declare an annual national day of prayer and then that day of prayer he enjoins you, the citizens, to pray together with other individuals and in churches. And, and, uh, tell, and usually the presidents every, the first, it's now the first Thursday in May, give us a laundry list mm -hmm. of what to pray about. It's absolutely unconstitutional. And we never fought harder to show our standing, to show how this had turned our organization upside down, how it had affected our members, what we had done year after year to fight it, all the other violations that occurred at the local level. We won this decision, but when it went up to the Seventh Circuit, yeah, they so said we didn't have standing. That's why it's disappointing that it got away from us because, again, the only decision on the merits is on our side. But the Seventh Circuit just ducked the issue by saying, you're not injured, you can't take the lawsuit. So they did not overturn the decision, they just did the same thing the Supreme Court did. And of course, this could be taken in another circuit. Um, we are still looking for a local violation where somebody cannot avoid it, uh, you know, where there would be good standing, um, really personal standing. So it may be something that we can revisit. Well, according to the appeals court, um, the only person who would have standing to sue would be the president himself. Right? And the president is being told by Congress to do this, and if the president doesn't want to, the president, of course, what president is going to challenge the day of prayer? But it is quite an injury to the president yeah. to force him or her to um, try to um, affect the consciences of constituents, which is what Thomas Jefferson said the president did not have the right to do. He put that in a letter. Mm -hmm. He had no power to direct the conscience of his constituents. So maybe someday we will get a president who's willing and brave enough to, to go for it. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? There's a few more questions here. Um, Doug Roberts, how do you see the future of religion, not just in the USA but around the world? What do you think the global theocratic landscape will look like in 2050 and 2100? Well, Doug, I used to have the gift of prophecy, and if you'll put your hand on the video screen, I think you'll feel the Spirit telling you that we don't know what the future is going to be like. But Although there are um, a lot of predictions by um, pollsters and um, people like Pew, and I'd have to go look those up. I have seen that by 2030, um, the nuns in the United States will now up outnumber Nun Protestants. Nuns? The N-O-N-E-S. Not no. <laughs> uh, Right now we, un uh, we um, outnumber what used to be the largest um, denomination, Catholics. But Protestants as a group, there are more Protestants in this country than Catholics. So I think that the demographics will continue to climb in the United States. But I think that some of the projections for the rise of the Muslim religion worldwide by 2040, I'd have to go back and look at it, are not as promising. But again, um, as a founder, co-founder of a controversial group, I am an optimist. Yeah. You have to be. And uh, I think it could get very bad, or I think it could get very good. I like to say this is the best of times to be a free thinker. There's never been more of us.
spot in the state church angle, maybe the worst of times in the courts. When we look at what's happening around the world in um, uh, uh, theocratic nations, the, the kind of contamination of many of the, the Muslim areas of the world with theocracy, it's very scary. Um, we are seeing what, what's going on in Egypt, um, just another arrest for mm -hmm. blasphemy, uh, what's going on with the bank. We've worked with um, trying to help people who are endangered in Bangladesh. We know Bona Ahmed, whose husband was hacked to death in the streets just for being an atheist. Um, the photographer who took pictures and rescued her, got them to the hospital, mm -hmm. hasn't been able to stay employed we because he helped that, atheists. Yeah. Um, you know, th these things are very, very alarming, and we would be, I think, naive, I don't want to be naive anymore, to disregard that we have a real battle um, on our hands, and it's a battle for the Enlightenment. But I think what we can say, Doug, is that in the United States, if the current trends continue, we are becoming much more secular, especially the younger generations. If those trends continue, then we will be, uh, we'll be catching up with Europe. We'll look more like Europe looks, where most people don't even go to church. They have these beautiful, empty cathedrals over there. So I think there's cause for optimism, at least in our country. And of course, there's a lot going on in Europe, too, that, that is concerning. Um, it really is the fight of those who want the government to force their religion on everyone versus those of us who want freedom of conscience. And that was really the basis of our U.S. Constitution. Another question, this is from Hollis Evan Ramsey. When will there be a major film about Vashti McCollum modeled after One Woman's Fight? What a great question. Yeah. And um, we know someone who has written a, a script. Rick Smith has written And um, we've sent it around to several people and haven't gotten any bites, but we haven't given up um, that this would happen. It's such a dramatic story. Um, we have reprinted Vashti McCollum's book, One Woman's Fight, with the help of her family. And it's as readable as a novel, and it's so sympathetic about being in the 40s and having children being persecuted because they weren't taking religion classes in the schools. And told so sympathetically, she's such a feisty heroine, it's unnatural. And so um, we will keep working on that. There is a wonderful documentary about it. Uh, the Lord yes. is not on trial here today filmed in Peoria. Uh, and that is going to make it easier, I think, to make a feature film out of it. If you looked at The Loving Story, mm -hmm. there was a documentary on HBO about the fight um, for interracial, to get rid of the interracial um, ban that mm -hmm. races couldn't, couldn't intermingle. And uh, that was in Virginia in 1965. And then they turned it into a wonderful yeah. feature story, which I don't know, called um, Loving. Yeah. You remember how beautiful oh, that yeah, film sure. was? And, didn't should, get any Oscars. It should have it should won have, everything, I yeah, think. Yeah, it was uh, beautiful. And so we would not give up hope that we can tell that story. Her children are still alive. They're in their late 70s and early 80s. Yeah. And um, there's so much um, So much personal interest. And then the little boy, one of the little boys in the story, you know, who went to the court and saw all this. He became an attorney. Then he became mayor of the very town years Dan, later. Dan McCollum. Dan McCollum. And then Jim McCollum, who was the, the actual plaintiff in the case, became a constitutional attorney. Yeah. They're both good activists. So. You know, we should bring them on this show. You know, we should bring Jim in here well, someday. Well, or Free this. Thought Matters, our TV yeah. show, yes. So here's a final question. This is from Colin McNamara. I wonder who that is. Colin is one of our uh, attorneys here. In your opinion, what is the most egregious violation that FFRF has taken action against in its 40-year history? The most egregious. Oh, Colin, that is really a hard one. Um, I kind of think that uh, a case that um, uh, Andrew worked on in FFRF. Andrew Seidel. And, and we hi ended up hiring an outside counsel. Um, it was a lawsuit about uh, children in first grade and kindergarten who were being forced to pray. Um, this is just a few years ago. I mean, there's more than 65 years of solid Supreme Court precedent against prayer um, in schools. And they, it was just as if those cases hadn't um, been handed down by the court. And um, there were two children, and one was in kindergarten, and one was in first grade. And the first grader was actually told, it wasn't just the teacher trying to get her to pray, they were all pressuring her when she wouldn't pray. 
her gym teacher would then go to her, or the art teacher was pressuring her. And they were at one point told her, uh, when she must have said, well, my mom doesn't pray, um, they said, your mother could not be a good person if she doesn't pray and believe in God. They told, this is the public school telling a small child that. The kindergartner was so concerned because they were making the kindergartner leave the class when the prayers were happening and openly announcing originally, oh, the parents don't want this child to pray. And hmm. then the child had to go outside. It's, that's exactly why we have these court decisions to protect yeah. that. That this kindergartner had to leave the public schools. And eventually, we won this case. It was settled pretty promptly. The parents had to, to, you know, they fled. I mean, it was such an unwelcoming community. But that just, I think, shows the harm of religion and government. Well, another case like that was Dayton, Tennessee. Yes. Uh, the religious Bible college in town was sending students in to teach basically Sunday school classes in the public fifth grade classroom. The teachers left the classroom, and for an hour each week, these preachers, basically, these students, were coming in and teaching Sunday school lessons to the public school students. And the plaintiffs... And it, was, it was really fundamentalism. Yeah, and so the plaintiffs, uh, the parents didn't even tell their daughters that they were suing because they didn't want their daughters to get in any trouble. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the school board voted unanimously to fight us. The, the county board voted unanimously to fight us. And, of course, we won. It was a slam-dunk case. But, Dan, but, do you remember that um, you know, when you have a protective order and, and the name isn't public, the people that you're suing, some of them still have a right to see those names. Yeah. They just can't publish them. And so we had the, the general philosophy when you sue is sue everybody you can think of in the government that might have a hand in this. And then you can always drop them. So one, was it the school board president was dropped or somebody from the school board was dropped? And she said, I'm going to tell everybody it was the editor of the paper. Well, the editor of the paper was going to publish it because yeah. the plaintiff, the named uh, complainant, was going to tell who these people were. And they public. luckily they said, we're going to go forward and name these names. And then the suit would have been over because the family would have had to leave town. So what happened? Well, so our attorney had to drive down in the middle of the night from Nashville down to Chattanooga and get an order from the judge which then they drove into the newspaper the next morning there in Dayton saying you cannot publish, you're violating a federal order if you publish these names. So it was, the whole town wanted to know who's opposed to the Bible? They were all upset it, they about were, uh, it. was constant fomentation and who are these people? And actually then they were sort of revealing their name that um, last year when we put up the Clarence Darrow statue, the same woman who was our main nemesis in the lawsuit in her 70s yeah. or 80s is still there. She, what, what was the sign that she put up? Well, the plaintiffs, we can say now, their name was Jacobson. And so she put on her front yard, who is Daniel, Jacob's son? So they kind of knew who it was, and they were trying to go after this family to run them out of town. This, by the way, is Dayton, Tennessee, is the same place where the uh, Scopes trial took place in that courthouse with William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow. So that whole area of Tennessee had this history of pro-Bible fighting for Jesus. But also to conclude, I mean, this was a really, really fraught case. It was very stressful for the family. But what non nobody knew was that the little girls who didn't know that they were the plaintiffs, the parents didn't say anything around them, everybody else knew who they were. And um, their mother was part American Indian. It was a racist town. They thought that the reason they didn't have any friends and nobody would sit with them in the lunchroom was partly their skin was a little darker. They were trying to yeah. understand why, she said later, this girl contacted us, why people would close the lockers on their little fingers. And it makes yeah. you want to cry. They didn't know yeah. why people were up, you know, treating them that way until years later. Yeah. So, you know, it's such a bad thing to have religion and government. So the cases that we take are not just abstract legal principles. They're real people with real children in real schools suffering real harm. And maybe you know someone in your town, or maybe you've been involved in a case of discrimination or isolation or bullying because of your views. And it's satisfying when we can not even have to go to court, sometimes just writing a letter, but we can stop some of these abuses from happening and you know, make our country truly egalitarian, where, where a person's religion shouldn't have to matter to their status in society. So and that's all the questions. Yeah, so I think that's a very good place to end it. 
and um, we are very committed to moving forward to the day when we do ourselves out of a job where we do not need to have a Freedom From Religion Foundation anymore because there is respect restored for this constitutional principle and for the principle of freedom of conscience where everybody is equal regardless of their views on religion. What are we going to talk about next week? I think we're going to talk about the Bible Museum, finally. The Bible Museum? Yeah, Andrew Seidel will join us, and we went, uh, we were masochists and we toured it, hmm. and we'll tell you all about it. Either next, next week or the week after, we'll talk about our atheists visiting the Bible Museum. So uh, watch us next week at 12 noon Central Time on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. And please consider joining us. If you are a member, thank you. If you're not, no obligation, but we'd be glad to send you information if you just Click on the link, um, send us more information at our website at fffraf.org. We're 33,000 members, actually. We should be 50,000. I'm not setting that as a goal for the year, but 35 by the end of the year. When you look at all the religion and how organized they are, we really, we free thinkers really need to band together uh, to, to work um, for the Enlightenment. Our motto is freedom depends on free thinkers. Thank you for watching.